you so much for inviting me to, to come out. I'm assuming if Mark invited me, everybody here agreed. It's a democracy, right? So very glad to be here. And I didn't get to see, but just show of hands, how many folks from here went to Beth Messiah with Mark? Okay, now how many of you actually danced when you were at our synagogue? Oh, you, you better repent, I think. No, I'm joking. <laughs> Don't be smoking or drinking. You may be in a lot of trouble. <laughs> if you didn't get to go, part of our, our synagogue and part of just Jewish life for us is we do a lot of Davidic dance in, in our congregation, and we invite people to come and be a part of it. We're a very animated, lively group of Jews and non-Jews, and it's a community that I'm proud to be part of, and I'm absolutely honored to be here today with you guys. And when Mark called me, he said, listen, Michael, I've been going through this series um, talking about uh, Jesus in the Old Testament. Now, listen, you guys, I'm, I'm Jewish, so I'm probably going to slip into just saying Yeshua. Now, when I say that, don't say God bless you. That's not a sneeze. Um, <laughs> That's how we say his name in Hebrew, okay? So if, if you're okay, I'll, I'm going to say Yeshua, and you guys, you're going to know I'm referring to? All right, good. So no one is confused in the room. And there's probably a couple little, you know, Hebrew words that I'll say time here and there, and I'll explain why we're using it and, and how we're using it and what it means for you guys to follow along. And whenever Mark said, listen, I'm, I'm teaching through Yeshua in the Hebrew Bible and showing this stream of thought from Genesis 3.15 to the one who's promised to crush the head of the serpent coming all the way through. And I know he talked to you about Yaakov or Jacob's dream there at Bethel, and he's beginning to explain and bring you to Moses or Moshe, he said, Michael, pretty much the whole Hebrew Bible is open to you, and you can pick any spot to land on. And I thought, oh, that is too generous, because there's a lot of great stuff. I mean, going all the way to Yeshua, what can we not talk about? And so I've been praying over this, and I thought, where I would like to land with you guys is in a very famous section of the scriptures called Jonah. So that's where we're going to be today is in the book of Jonah. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and grab them and pull them out. And we're going to do a kind of a, a survey and dip in and dip out and talk about this wonderful book that I think most people are very, very familiar with this book. Now, for us Jews, this is required reading. You guys remember when you went to college and you had required reading by the professors? For us Jews, Jonah is required reading. Once a year, we fast on a day called Yom Kippur, Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. And it's mandatory fasting. And on the Day of Atonement, we don't eat any food. We don't drink any water. And God help me, we're not, a, we're not supposed to have any coffee. And I do break that rule. Man's got to have some. And um, we're supposed to afflict our souls to the uttermost. And, and so on, on Yom Kippur, we say to one another, may you have a really hard fast. And it's really grueling what we go through. And so this year, I thought I would make the fast even harder on our congregation. So I did a four-hour teaching on Jonah. Some of you guys are like, that's a hard fast. <laughs> and I'm going to condense it down into just a few moments to talk about some incredible things from this book. And you know, no, no, Mark has taught y'all that in the Hebrew Bible, there are direct prophecies. There are words that are given that point in the future towards one specific person, the Messiah of Israel, Yeshua. But then there are also stories that predict. They look forward into the future, and they tell us something. And the book of Jonah is one of those stories. But here's the unique thing about the book of Jonah. Here's the big idea. It's about the rebellious prophet who hates his God for loving his enemies. Now, that is an interesting story filled with all kinds of twists and ironies. How can a prophet hate his God? Isn't the nature of a prophet to love his God? So we want to ask the question, what is, first of all, Jonah all about? I mean, is it really a book that is just primarily about a fish? Is that what the story is all about? I mean, when you go and you go to a bookstore and you were to look at any shelf with the book of Jonah on there, usually you will find images like those that are up on the screen. And usually everything about Jonah is about the big fish. But Jonah's not a fish story. <laughs> 
As a matter of fact, it's not even one of the most commonly used words in the book of Joan. And I think sometimes people get so focused on the VeggieTale virgin version of Jonah, they miss how important this book is for understanding about the Messiah himself. Folks, it's not a fish story. It's not a litmus test to find out if you can discover the fish, the whale that actually swallowed a man. Now, in most of the books, they show you a big gigantic whale. In the Michael Val version, I imagine a great white shark because that would be supernatural if a great white swallowed him and didn't chew him up. That would be amazing. We don't actually know what kind of a fish it was. We know that something in this story happened, though, that was absolutely amazing. But here's what you got to understand about Jonah. Not a fish story. It's more like a classic whodunit kind of a story. But it's even more than that. It's like the Sherlock Holmes episodes where Sherlock is, is chasing after one of the bad guys and he's right on the heels of capturing the bad guy only to find that he just walked into a trap and he himself has been caught. The book of Jonah, it's not just a whodunit story. It's actually a youdunit story. Because it keeps calling us to come back and evaluate ourselves in a way that we didn't do before we actually looked at the story itself. And when it opens up, we tend to think, hey, it's going to be a book just like every other book of prophecy in the Hebrew Bible. I keep seeing Hebrew Bible. That means Old Testament, if you're not familiar. Um, the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, opens up and it says, now the word of Adonai. In, in Hebrew, we, um, we don't like to say uh, Yud, Yahweh. Uh, we don't pronounce his name, so we say Adonai. So every time you see Adonai, just know that's how we refer to God's divine name. Uh, it's just a term of respect. Now the word of Adonai came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, and at this point we're like, oh, this is good stuff. This is just like how Jeremiah the prophet opens. It's how Ezekiel opens. It's how all of the great prophets open. But how many people know after this first line, there are no prophecies? It's all story from that point on through the rest of the book. It's one long story with a prayer right in the middle. Not even close to what any of the other prophecies look like. It's interesting because Jonah is God's word to his people about a prophet. It's a prediction that's looking at a specific person. And we know that our Messiah, our Lord, Yeshua, talked about this. Remember, he was talking to some Pharisees, and he said, this generation's a wicked generation. It demands a sign, yet no sign will be given it except the sign of Jonah. For just as Jonah became a sign to the Ninevites, so also the Son of Man will be to this generation. The men of Nineveh will rise up at the judgment with this generation, will condemn it, because they repented at Jonah's proclamation. And indeed, one greater than Jonah is here. Yeshua acknowledges that Jonah was a real person at our synagogue when people ask me questions like, do I think Jonah really happened? Do I think Jonah was a real person? Usually what I say is something simply like this. There was a Jewish guy. He was born according to ancient prophecies in the town of Bethlehem, exactly how the prophets predicted he was going to be born. Then he lived a righteous life of Torah obedience. He was perfectly faithful to the law of Moses and the law of God. He loved people like you couldn't possibly imagine. And that same guy, he said there was a person named Jonah. Now, that guy also died according to ancient predictions and prophecy, and he rose again from the third day. If that guy said it's true, I'm going with him. That, that's, I'm, no matter what, I'm going with him. I'm not really too concerned about what the latest fad in scholarship is. I'm ultimately going with the guy who came back from the dead. That makes good sense to me. So he says there's this guy named Jonah. But what kind of a book is Jonah? Jonah is satire. It's like the classic 
satire that we used to see on Saturday Night Live. I don't like some of it that's out right now, but this is one of my favorite characters from SNL. Her name is Penelope, and every time Penelope comes out, she is the classic one-upper. You know what a one-up person is, right? That person, you're in a conversation, and you share that something was really going wrong in your life, and they've got a Mine's doubly wrong. Mine went even worse. Or if you had something good happen, they go, but let me tell you about the really, really good thing that happened with me. Penelope is that character on Saturday Night Live. But here's the thing about satire. Here's what it's meant to do. It's meant to to get you to laugh at that person, but then you have to see it in yourself. Because at some point in time, we all one up. We just tend to do it. It just depends who we're around. That's the nature of what satire does. It's aimed at critiquing you while getting you to laugh at the same time by holding up certain characters to ridicule. And that's the beauty of Jonah. I mean, think about the book of Jonah. You've got pagan sailors who are repenting, and they have no business repenting. You have a pagan king who at a certain point in time, he begins repenting. And just to put the cherry on top of the ice cream, you even get cows and animals that are repenting in the book of Jonah. It's a lively world in Nineveh, but there's only one person in the book of uh, Jonah who doesn't repent. It's Jonah. (laughs) And it should make us laugh when we hear it. But then you have to look in the mirror. Because how true is that of us sometimes? Everybody around us is really following the Lord, but where are we? Seems like everybody else, but where are we? And that's what Jonah does. But it's also kind of like, at least in my imagination, it's a lot like a comic book. Because everything in Jonah is disproportionate. It's all blown up, really huge. One of the most important words in the book of Jonah is this Hebrew word, gadol, which means huge. And when you read through Jonah, it wasn't just a storm. It was a huge storm. It wasn't just a fish. It was a huge fish. It wasn't just a city. It was a huge city over and over again. Everything is big and disproportionate and way blown up out of size. And listen, for a culture that communicated everything orally and didn't have images, this is good storytelling. It's actually the kind of storytelling that when it's done well in Hebrew, everybody is laughing at a certain point in time because it's just huge and it's big and it's designed to be that way to catch your attention to bring you into this world, into this story that's filled with contradictions. The word of Adonai, or the word of the Lord, came to Jonah, and his name means a dove. Beautiful name. He's the son of Amiti, or Mitai, which in Hebrew means uh, my faithfulness. So he is Jonah, the son of my faithful one. Right at the beginning, we're like, oh, this story's going to go well. This is the right kind of man. He's like a beautiful bird in his father's name, my faithfulness. Everything's going to go well for him. Rise, go to the great city of Nineveh. Call out to her, for their evil has risen before me. And we know a little bit about Nineveh. This is a, a picture from later on, a little bit past Jonah's time of Hebrew slaves being taken to the ancient city of Nineveh there with a child and some men all the way over to the east is where they are heading towards one of the major metropolitan areas of the ancient Near Eastern world. But how does our faithful dove respond to his God? He should be like a homing pigeon going exactly where he's supposed to. But instead, He rises up and he goes to Tarshish from the presence of Adonai. And he went down to Jaffa. He found a ship going to Tarshish and he paid the fee. Interesting, Mark will correct me later if I'm wrong about this because he's a much better scholar than I am. But in Hebrew, it's a little ambiguous. We don't know if he just paid the fare for himself or if he was so desperate, he actually bought the entire ship so that he paid for everybody's fee. They, it might as kind of like the pictures. He went down and said, hey, I'd like to go to Tarshish. And they go, well, we're not really going that direction. He goes, look, what would it cost to rent the entire boat? That's like asking a carnival cruise liner to go in an opposite direction and you're gonna pay for everybody. 
That's kind of the image that gets drawn up here. He's very desperate to get away from the presence of Adonai. He starts here in Joppa, and he begins his cruise. That's the best graphic I got all day, guys. So if you weren't impressed, that's really it at this point in time. He flees and he goes to Joppa. And then we get this interesting expression. It says, but the Lord hurled a powerful wind, a great wind on the sea. Such a violent tempest arose on the sea, the sea that the ship threatened to break up. Now, this is unusual because all of a sudden the ship takes on a personality of its own. And the ship does not like Jonah being on it. And the way it's worded in Hebrew, it's the ship itself is going, get out of me. Again, it's like a comic book. It's interesting. You're going, ships don't have personalities. Well, in the book of Jonah, they do. Everything seems to become animated and come to life. And he's out here somewhere in the Mediterranean Sea. And he's not getting anywhere that he wants to go. So the sailors that are on the ship, they realize something is terribly wrong. So they are afraid. They cried each man to his own God. They cast things over the side of the ship to lighten it up, which that's a good practice to do. They were practical polytheists. They believed in many gods. They were loyal to whatever God was in control of that region. So they're probably praying to some kind of a sea god or some kind of a god they thought could possibly save them from that moment. But what does Jonah do, our faithful dove? He goes down to take a nap. Not like Yeshua. <laughs> this is a very different kind of sleeping. This is a trying to ignore the situation. And in the book of Jonah, there's a subtle play that's going on that he went down to Jaffa. He went down to the ship. He goes down below deck. He goes fast to sleep at sea. And then in chapter 2, it says he goes all the way down to the depths of the ocean. We like to call that the bottom of the barrel. And in Hebrew, it's very intentional. But we've got to keep coming through this because we need to understand it to understand the sign of Jonah and what's going on with this rebellious prophet. And if you think about this question, who suffers as the result of Jonah's sin? Who is the one facing all of the problems? It's everybody around Jonah. This is interesting. It's a little bit different than in our culture. See, Jonah's apathy is very dangerous. See, I think in our culture, we tend to think of sin as just being me. It just affects me. What happens in Vegas, it stays in the television. <laughs> It'll make media. <laughs> We tend to think that sin is a very private affair. As long as nobody finds out, as long as it basically doesn't hurt anybody that I'm aware of, we're all good. The Hebrew Bible, and including the New Testament, sin is never a private affair. Actually, sin is not just about me, it's about we. That what happens here affects people out here in my relationship circle, that sin hurts you just as much as it hurts me. And Jonah's apathy is not a private affair. He's putting people's lives on the line because of his rebellion. That's a very important clue in Jonah. See, when you rebel, it hurts we and not just me. And that's kind of a peculiar Jewish thought. We tend to be a we people. We think in the plural quite a bit in terms of community. But think about this, where does this show up in each of your lives? Sin is never a private affair. It hurts the inside of the family, relationships, and then it just spreads out from there. But that's one of the key themes in Jonah. It's one of the things that Yeshua picks up on. But do you hear the irony? The chief sailor came near to him and said, why are you sleeping? Get up, call out to your God. Do you hear the irony? You have a polytheistic pagan sailor asking a Hebrew prophet to pray. That don't make no sense. <laughs> Good prophets are praying prophets. Good prophets see storms and water comes, or they pray for rain to come. Here you've got pagan, pagan sailors going to Hebrew prophet, a Hebrew prophet, asking him to pray. And then each one said, come on, let's cast lots. That's a good practice. That's like rolling dice to find out who the, the number is going to come up on so we can know why this evil is going. And so the lot fell on 
Jonah because God is in control of this whole thing. And they said, tell us now on account of this evil is happening to us. What is your profession? I mean, are you a dentist? Because I would imagine that this would come if you were a dentist doing root canals, send a storm. Get must have a few dentists in the room. Okay, fine, I'll pick on the lawyers. If you're a lawyer... <laughs> Where did you come from? What is your land? What nation are you? These are good questions to ask. They're trying to drill down to figure out if there's some kind of problem between this person and what he does and a particular deity or a God. And then Jonah says, I'm a Hebrew and I fear Adonai, the God of the heavens who made the sea and the dry land. But we're meant to ask this question. Does he really believe what he says? Does he really fear his God? I mean, he's saying the right things, right? As a matter of fact, sign him up for membership. He just dotted the I and crossed the T. He knows the right thing to say. But there's a problem. Jonah's confession and his obedience, they are in a deep contradiction with one another. Deep contradiction. He knows the right thing to say, but is he really doing the right thing? And we can kind of laugh at this a little bit. Here he is claiming to fear God who made, he puts it first, the sea and the dry land. But he's definitely not acting like one who really fears his God. This is interesting. Does this ever show up in anybody's life besides mine where there is a deep contradiction between what I say and what I do? Or am I the only one in the room? Thank you, all six of you. <laughs> it happens, doesn't it? It is easier to believe than it is to behave a lot of times. But belief is supposed to shape behavior, change behavior. But with Jonah, it's not happening. Then the men became afraid with an overwhelming fear. You notice Jonah says he's fearing God, but these men are actually fearing. <laughs> what have you done? For they knew he'd fled from the presence of Adonai because he had told them so. <laughs> Who's acting like the God-fearer, the one who claims it or the ones who are doing it? Again, the irony that shows up here. You get Jonah, I worship the Lord who made the sea and the land. No, you don't, Jonah. Come on, you're talking out both sides of your face. The people on the outside are acting more like the insiders. That's strange. The people outside the four walls are doing it better than the one who knew what it was like to be inside the four walls. But that's the point of Jonah. It's this satire. Again, folks, it's not a Veggie Tale movie. <laughs> it's not a fish story. It's a classic you done it story meant to pull you into the mirror and take deep evaluations of yourself. So they said to him, what should we do so that the sea will become calm for us? For the storm, it kept on raging and raging. And he said, pick me up, throw me in the sea. He said to him, then the sea will become calm for you. For I know it's because of me that this great storm is upon you. We have to ask the question, is Jonah being sacrificial? I mean, is he being like the Messiah? Throw me overboard so that way I become a sacrifice and save your lives? Or is he just doubling down and hardening his heart even more and saying, throw me overboard because I don't care if I die, I'm still not going to Nineveh. I would say more than likely it's the latter. Famous Jewish scholar named Uriel um, Shimon, he said this in his commentary, the JPS, he said, Jonah's flight is explained as a, review, a refusal to show Gentiles the way to repentance and salvation. The forceful blocking of his flight, by contrast, is meant to point us toward the true meaning of election. Israel was chosen to serve as the carrier of faith in order to disseminate it among all nations. That's what Israel's calling was to be a light to the nations. And Jonah is saying, nope, turning the light switch off. And going the exact opposite direction. And again, you look at the pagan sailors. They've got more compassion than Jonah. They begin to row, trying to get back to the land. They don't want to throw this guy overboard. So notice what happens. They cried out to Adonai and they said, Please, Adonai, don't let us perish on account of the soul of this man. Don't put innocent blood on us. For you, Adonai, have done as you please. So they picked up Jonah and they threw him into the sea. And the sea stilled from its raging. The picture is almost instantaneous. 
throw them overboard, and then all of a sudden the sun comes out and there's a beautiful rainbow and the birds are singing. It's amazing how quick things begin to happen. And they become afraid with an overwhelming fear of Adonai. And they offered sacrifices to Adonai and they made vows to him. Notice in the book of Jonah, the first prayer that's often offered up is not by Jonah, it's by pagan sailors. The first sacrifice in the book of Jonah is not by the Hebrew prophet, it's by these sailors. The first vow of obedience that made, that's made here is not by the Hebrew prophet, it's by those who were impacted by what was going on all around them. Are you getting the picture about this rebellious prophet? He should have been doing these things the whole time, but instead he's refusing to. Jonah ignores all God is doing around him because he's hardened his heart towards God. That's the reality of spiritual apathy. That's what happens when we begin to close ourselves off to what God is doing personally. And think about everybody that's experiencing God. Sailors, the ship wants to break apart, the sea, everything around Jonah is experiencing God except for Jonah. Wouldn't it be an absolute, and we in Yiddish like to say Shanda, if during this season, everybody around you was experiencing the miracle that we're celebrating, but you hardened your heart and you didn't experience the beauty of this time of Emmanuel, God becoming flesh amongst us and that humbling our hearts. What a beautiful time of the year it is. Think about as we look around everywhere, it's the same scenario. It seems like everybody's celebrating this. What are we doing? The insiders who know the truth. Everyone can see Jonah's apathy, but he can't. That tends to happen. Looking in, they can see it. He doesn't see it. So the Lord sent a huge fish to swallow Jonah. What kind of a fish was it? I don't know. In Hebrew, the word's very ambiguous. Maybe it was a big, gigantic whale. In my version, I like to think it was a great white shark. That seems very comical to me. We don't know what kind of a fish because that's really not the point of the story. That's not the point at all. I want you to think for a second. If you were out in Galveston, that beautiful beach that God has blessed us with... <laughs> And you were there, and you were out fishing, you know, and you were out by those um, oil rigs, and you were doing some deep sea fishing, getting some snapper. And if anybody does that, please come to my house when you get back. I love some good snapper. And, you know, if you were out there and you're one of those guys, and your buddy fell overboard, and you went to go grab him, and then all of a sudden a fish went oh, and swallowed him and took him down, what would you think happened to your buddy? That's right, he's dead. <laughs> Now, you would hope maybe, you know, for a couple hours, you're going to call the Coast Guard and you're going to hope he might resurface. But if he doesn't resurface, you pretty much are going to assume what has happened. He's gone. We're going to hold a service for this guy. That's what you're going to think is going on. You see, that's what the book of Jonah is about. See, it's predicting something about the Messiah. That's what Yeshua was trying to drive the train of prophecy towards, that the instrument of Jonah's death becomes the instrument for his life. The thing that swallows him whole in the water is the thing that's going to preserve his life under the water. And that's exactly what the Messiah was trying to talk to the people of Israel about. They said, we want to see a sign from you. And he said, the only sign that's going to be given to you is the sign of the prophet Jonah. For just as Jonah was in the belly of this huge fish for three days and for three nights, the Son of Man will be in the heart of the earth for three days and for three nights. But our people didn't get it, that the instrument of Yeshua's death becomes the instrument for his life. We looked on this Roman crucifix and we thought to ourselves, that's a horrible thing. He's obviously dead. There's no way somebody like that's coming back. But he did come back. You see, when Yeshua was talking to them about this, he said, guys, Think deeply about Jonah. Think deeply about this sign, this moment in history. You have a rebellious prophet who hates his God for loving his enemies, but he says someone greater than Jonah is here. And do you want to know how Yeshua, Jesus, is greater than Jonah? He loved his God for loving his enemies. Yeshua loved that God loved the tax collectors 
the hookers, the poor, the disenfranchised, those that were the outskirts of society. Yeshua loved that his father loved his enemies. He was greater than Jonah in every way. That's what the sign was meant to point us toward. And the book of Jonah itself was meant to point us as Jewish people in this direction, that there would be something even greater than Jonah to come. But wait, like Sham Wow said, there is more. <laughs> the people of Nineveh will stand up in judgment with this generation to condemn it because they repented when Jonah preached to them. And now something greater than Jonah is here. Do you notice the, the, the English, something greater than Jonah is here? He doesn't say someone, but something. What is the something that's greater than Jonah? It was the death that Yeshua would die. It was a greater thing than what Jonah was going to go through. So Jonah, back to our story, began to come into the city for one day's journey. Now remember, the city of Nineveh, it says, was three days journey. So Jonah goes one third of the way into the city. And we have to begin to ask ourselves the question, is he wholly obedient to God and what he was asked to do? And he cries out saying, another 40 days and Nineveh will be overthrown. Exclamation mark. End of sermon. Let me just narrow it down for you. That's his whole sermon right there. There wasn't even a question and answer time. In Hebrew, it's literally five words. Old Abaim Yom Veninava Nechafachet. That's it. Sermon's over. He walked in one third of the way and he goes, another 40 days, Nineveh, gone. Any questions? All right. Did my job, God. I'm out of here. Is that really doing what God asked him to do? He's doing the bare minimum necessary to feel like he has fulfilled his obligation to the Lord. It's kind of like that person who believes that the way to maybe go out and evangelize is to walk up to somebody and say, hey, don't forget you're going to be going to hell. <laughs> out of here. <laughs> Drop the mic like it's hard. You know, I mean, done. <laughs> Not a great way to do things. Amen. We understand a little bit better. <laughs> Here's the thing, the writer of Jonah really wants you to believe that his sermon is a five-word sermon. That's it, five words in Hebrew. Very simple, to the point. Do you notice there's a lot wanting from this sermon? He could have at least said God's name in the sermon somewhere. Another 40 days and Nineveh will be overthrown by God. That would have been nice. At least we could have got God's name into the sermon. Add a sixth word. It would have been really easy in Hebrew. But he does none of this. Why? Even the experience of being in the belly of the well was not enough to change his heart. And that's it. You want to hold on to this because this is why Yeshua, our Messiah, really lays down a lot of leverage about people who hear the gospel message but don't repent. It's very important. Another 40 days. And in Hebrew, that word overthrown, it's the word um, hafach is how we say it. And in our, in our synagogue, when we start off our services, we always use this word. And we hold up our Bibles and we say, hafoch ba, hafoch ba, dekola ba, hafoch ba, hafoch ba, mashiach ba. Turn it and turn it. Everything you need is in it. Turn it and turn it for the Messiah is in it. Funny, a few weeks ago, somebody accused me. They, they accused me. I think they were trying to be mean-spirited to me. And they, they said, you know, Michael, when you do that thing and you have people hold up your Bibles, you're just trying to be the Jewish Joel Olstein. And, and I think they were trying to be mean to me. And I went, Mazel Tov. I said, I actually, that's a compliment. Most Jewish people love Joel Olstein, so I'll take that all day long. That's fantastic. It's good. And then I ended it with, with God bless you, and thank you for tuning in this morning. Okay. Uh, <laughs> My dad watched Joel Osteen till the day he died. He loved Joel. But here's the interesting thing about that word hafak, a hafok. It can be either used good or bad, Isaiah 63.10. But they rebelled and grieved his ruach hakodesh. That's how we say Holy Spirit in Hebrew, ruach hakodesh. So he turned to become their enemy. Hosea 7.8, Ephraim mixes himself with the peoples. Ephraim has become a pancake that never gets turned over. It's a bad sense. Joy has ceased in our hearts. Our dance has turned into mourning. It is hafoked or turned over. But it can also be used in a very good sense. And 
Adonai, your God, turned the curse into a blessing for you. That's a really good thing to have happen. First Samuel 10, then the Ruach, that means spirit of Adonai, will seize you, will prophesy with them, and you will turn into another man. That's talking about the conversion of a man's heart. And then Psalm 30, 12, you turned my mourning into dancing, the exact opposite of Lamentations 5. So depending on the context, that word can be either really good or really bad. So we ask the question, which versions did the Ninevites hear? Jonah's version was probably something like another 40 days and Nineveh, Nineveh will be overthrown and he probably meant destroyed. But I think to the Ninevite ear, they heard another 40 days and Nineveh will be transformed. See, in my mind, as a Jewish person, what brought me to the Messiah, and some of you have heard my testimony online, was the power of His grace. I knew how mighty my God was. I mean, the Scriptures say He touches mountain and they smoke. He puts His foot down and Mount Lebanon splits. I knew how powerful my God was. But when that same power is turned into grace... There's something about that that's beautiful and attractive. I think what the Ninevites heard was that the God who was Lord over everything was willing to have grace with them, was willing to transform them, and it provoked a response. I think Jonah was committing what I like to call prophetic sabotage. He was giving them the bare minimum with the hopes that they actually wouldn't repent. But God has a way of taking what we mean for evil and turning it into good. So despite what Jonah may have meant, I think God went ahead and used it to get himself glory and went ahead to use it to reach the Ninevites. So the people of Nineveh believed a five-word sermon in Hebrew. So look, you don't have any excuse for sharing the gospel either. I'm sure you got five words or at least three Yeshua loves you. God could use that too, I imagine. They believed and they called for a fast and they wore sackcloth from the greatest of them to the least of them. That's a way of saying everybody in Nineveh. And the word reached the king of Nineveh who rose up from his throne. He took off his royal robes, covered himself in sackcloth, and then he sat down in ashes. This is a big deal. It has reached from your house all the way to the White House. It has gone at the most national possible level in Nineveh. A five-word sermon is changing everything. In one of the worst cities in the ancient Near Eastern world, God is working a radical transformation. And the king made a proclamation saying, In Nineveh, by the decree of the king and his nobles, no man or beast, herd or flock, may taste anything. They must not graze or drink water, but cover man and beast with sackcloth. Let them cry out to God with urgency. Let each one turn from his evil way and from the violence of his hands. Now listen. We're supposed to be reading this at this point and going, the king sounds more like a prophet than the prophet sounds like a prophet. The king actually utters God's name a couple of different times and warns of evil and warns of sin and calls for repentance. That's what should have been on the mouth of the prophet. But remember, where's the prophet's heart? It's closed off. It's hard because he's hating his God for loving his enemies. He refuses to see how deep God's love is for those that are unlike him at this point. And it's a commentary on belief. The people of Nineveh believed God. Internally, they're convicted of sin. And then look at the actions. They called for a fast. They wore sackcloth from the greatest of them to the least of them. Externally, they responded to sin. I think we miss some of that sometimes in our culture. Uh, that... Repentance of sin and, and conviction of sin, it should look like you're doing something differently. It, it, it should look like things, things aren't the same that are coming through that one-eyed monster anymore called the television <laughs> or that one-eyed portal called your iPhone. It should look like different behaviors. It should sound different on your lips. You should be looking at people different. 
people stop being enemies and they start becoming friends, everything should begin to change. That's what repentance should do. Repentance is never something that just impacts me inside of here and then I just stay in the same spot. It, it should actually begin to, to grow like a plant and impact every single area of our lives. And the people of Nineveh, Yeshua said, those people, they're going to stand up at the judgment with this generation and they're going to condemn it because they repented when Jonah preached to them. How many words in Hebrew was his sermon? Five words. How many words did you just hear in the sermon that was delivered in that worship center? I promise it was more than five. There should have been something that said, today I need to live differently because of what I've heard. And Yeshua says, the men of Nineveh, some of the worst people known in ancient history, you think those guys are bad and horrible? In the great final judgment, they're going to stand up as examples of what you weren't and should have been. And he says, now something greater than Jonah is here. Not just a man going into a fish swallowed into the sea. It's God's only son who came and wrapped himself in flesh. Lived a perfect life of obedience to his God and to his law. Died as a willing sacrifice for his enemies. And he says, if that message doesn't cause your heart to well up when you hear it, what's happened? What's happened that we've become so disconnected or removed from when we hear that message? Shouldn't that cause us to want to change everything? If the greatest ruler in the ancient Near Eastern world, the king of Nineveh, heard a five-word message and it caused him to get off his place of power, take off his clothes of power, and put on clothes of mourning and repent, what should our lives look like? What should we be doing differently as a result of hearing this message week in and week out? More than five words. Sometimes it's at least 10 before you doze off or check your Facebook. I'm just joking, it's okay to laugh. <laughs> See, the people of Nineveh, they had a paper-thin conscience. It's amazing. You wouldn't have thought it. But their conscience is so paper-thin that you, you could have taken, I think, a paper clip and just dropped it from right here and gone, Psh, and it would have fallen and pierced right through. But Jonah, on the other hand, he's like a rock that you could drop paper clips on all day, and it just keeps bouncing off and bouncing off, and bouncing off, and bouncing off. But remember, Jonah is satire. It's not supposed to just be about Jonah. Who else is it supposed to be about? It's a classic you done it story. We should be looking in the mirror and asking ourselves that question. Notice what happens. Nineveh repents, and it greatly displeased Jonah, and he resented it. So we prayed to Adonai, and he said, Please, Lord, was not this what I said when I was still in my own country? Think about this. Who in your life right now, would it really, really bother you if they came to faith and they were doing it better than you? Some of you laugh because you know who I'm talking about. <laughs> I had him living next door to me. No, no, I, I do. And, and my friends know, know the story. He was a white supremacist, flag-waving Nazi, two doors down from me. Used to hang his Confederate flag outside of his garage because he knew I was a Jewish rabbi. One time he posted a sign up on the stop sign that's right in front of my house advertising a call to join the neo-Nazi party. And I can remember the first year that I lived there, I thought, well, God, I'll share the gospel with everybody but that guy. <laughs> that guy deserves where he's going. I'm happy if he goes there. <laughs> For a year, that's it. I'm sure none of you have ever done that, but that was where I was at. I'm sure, you've never had that thought before. But I thought, well, God, he's on his own. He's made his choices, and he can live with them. That's what I thought. And then Hurricane Harvey hit. You guys remember the storm that came through? 
And uh, our neighborhood was getting just absolutely pulverized like most of the communities. And I was sitting in my garage watching the water accumulate. And, and here's this, you know, neo-Nazi guy. And he's walking back and forth up and down the street. And he's got his shirt off because he liked to brandish all his tattoos and show off all his rankings. He had them, you know, you, if you can read tattoos, you can see them. And uh, I thought, you know, let's just see what happens. Let me quit being like Jonah and start being like Messiah. So I said, hey, and I'm not going to say his name. I said, why don't you come on into my garage and let's sit down and talk. And he looked at me and he thought, wow, this is as odd as I thought it was going to be. And um, so he came in and he sat there in my garage with me. And uh, first five minutes, he ran it off a lot of his white supremacist views about how Jews were this and that and the other. And talked to me about how he had driven to that rally in North Carolina. I remember the one that happened a while back and some people got killed there. He drove all the way there and back to support the white supremacist group that were there. And he began to talk to me about his views and so forth and so on. And then I shared my story with him about how I came to faith out of drugs and how I believed in Yeshua. And, and, and gave my life over to him. And he goes, oh, well, you're a different kind of Jew. He goes, I like Jews like you. And I was like, what do you mean Jews like me? We're all Jews. What do you, what is this? I mean, it's such a weird conversation to have. <laughs> but as I shared my story with him about where I came from, and I began to realize, you know, I was God's enemy. I know what it's like to be on the other side of the equation. I was also his foe. And then he began to confess his drug abuse and began to confess other things to me. And so right there in my garage, it turned into a prayer meeting. Amen. And uh, we talked to one another, and I would encourage him in the Lord. And uh, unfortunately, he's now in prison. Um, about two months after that, he drove down to Florida to a white nationalist rally that was being held there. And uh, he opened fire into a group of Jews and African Americans aiming to kill him, so now he'll be in jail for attempted murder. And maybe there, God will get a hold of him. You never know. Do I regret it? Absolutely not. Why be like Jonah when I can be like Yeshua? Reach out to our enemies. It's the only way. See, he said, that's what I anticipated. I fled from Tarshish, for I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God slow to anger, full of kindness, and relenting over calamity. Jonah says, I'm having an existential theological crisis. I don't like that you're so loving. Isn't that horrible to say to God? Can't you just be harder on people? I don't like all this compassion business. So please, Adonai, take my soul from me because better is my death than my life. That's how mad this prophet is at his God. <laughs> the Ninevites had a paper-thin conscience regarding sin and the need to change. That is always the right response. That's the response that Yeshua says we are supposed to have to what he has done for us. But Jonah, on the other hand, at the end of the story, has Jonah fundamentally changed? Nope. He's actually doubled down on his beginning position. At the end of the story, he's still the rebellious prophet who hates his God for loving his enemies. And Yeshua uses this little book with this story to point to a very powerful truth. That he was going to do something even greater than Jonah. And that if we saw that, and if we would believe it and hear that message, it could change everything about us. And that we would join a class of people like the Ninevites, and maybe not like Jonah, because he was the example to avoid, not the example to embrace. Very powerful story. Gordon Wilson in the Inniskillen bombing. Does anybody remember when this happened? It was in Ireland. Gordon Wilson was at what was going to be a public event that day, and it was an honorary event, and he was actually over in a store with his daughter, and the IRA uh, bombed that event that day. And the building that he was in with his daughter collapsed on top of them. And he's in this building and the walls and the bricks have fallen and he's holding his daughter's hand through the bricks. She is being crushed under the weight. And he records this in his own testimony on the BBC. He says this, she held my hand tightly and she gripped me as hard as she could. And she said to me, daddy, I love you very much. Those were her exact words to me. And those were the last words that I ever heard her say. Last thing. What kind of a response did Wilson give to this? 
He went live on national television within days. He was a committed follower of Yeshua. And he said this, I bear no ill will towards them. I bear no grudge. No sort of dirty talk is going to come out of my mouth. Nothing that I could do could bring her life back. She was a great gal. She was a great daughter. She's in heaven and I will meet her again. And he said on national television, I'll pray for these men tonight, every night and every day. And then he did something radical on national television. He said, I want to call for a meeting and I want the heads of the IRA and, and I want them to come here and I will tell them personally that I forgive them and I hold no nothing against them whatsoever. That's powerful. Do you know what the Christian community in Ireland did after that? They wrote him letters of hate speech saying, how could you forgive your enemies? How could you forgive people like that? And do you know what he did? He doubled down on forgiveness. And he responded not with hatred, not with animosity. He said, that's exactly what my Savior did. When he died, he didn't die just for friends. He died for enemies. And he keeps welcoming enemies into his kingdom. And he said, I want to be that kind of messenger. That's powerful, isn't it? You see, that's what Jonah points us towards. He was a rebellious prophet. He hates God for loving his people. None of us in this room, I assume, are prophets. If you are, I know a counselor who can help you. Um, <laughs> but I would assume that most people in this room, you are followers of the Messiah. How do you feel about your enemies? Do you reach across the aisle? Do you love them? Do you care for them? Do you go out of your way for them? During this season, what an amazing season right now that you're in to invite people to come here. Maybe they're not your enemies. Maybe they're your frenemies. They're in that, you know, kind of gray area. You see, the amazing thing that I think that Mark is teaching you, and, and that I think every one of the prophecies and predictions, whether it's a direct prophecy about the Messiah or a story that predicts about the Messiah, every one of them that I've ever read, they don't just point us towards him. They point us in the direction of how we're supposed to change because we know him now. It changes us on the inside. So my encouragement for you today, as you think long and hard, and as you take a deep dive into your own conscience and ask yourself, are there contradictions between what I say and what I do? Are the people on the outside of my life more like what should be on the inside? Or is the inside of my life so filled with compassion and love for those on the outside that I can't wait to get out there and tell them? As you think about that today, I would encourage you to spend some time before the Lord and evaluate your own conscience. Is it paper thin? So much so that a paperclip, you hear the message of God's word preached on Sunday and you don't walk out of there going, oh, you know, I got some good notes, wrote down some good things. Do you walk out of there and go, there's some things I'm gonna do differently today. By the time I hit my car, I'm gonna figure out how my life is going to change as a result of hearing this message. And if that's you, can I tell you what God can do with a life like that? That is absolutely amazing. Folks, I want to thank you so much for letting me come here and just share a little bit of the Bible with you guys. I appreciate all of you. Thank you for coming out this morning. And uh, Mark had said that this was okay. It's just a small thing. If you guys enjoy having a nice Jewish meal, we all want to invite you to our Passover Seder that's taking place in March. You can go to our uh, synagogue's website, cbmhouston.org, and get yourself a seat and a table. It sells out very fast. It's one of the largest and I think best in the city of Houston. It's one of our largest outreaches of the year. We'll have about 1,500 people at this Passover Seder, and it's a, a full traditional Jewish Seder meal with a lot of dance and music, great food, and all kinds of amazing stuff that's going on. So if you want, you can go to our website and get a ticket today. Um, I tell you, you won't regret it. You will absolutely love it. With that being said, can I pray for us and dismiss us now? Yivrechacha Adonai veyishmer recha, Yair Adonai penave lecha vehunecha, Isa Adonai penave lecha veyasim lecha. Shalom. May the Lord God bless you and keep you. May he lift up his face over you and be merciful to you. May the Lord God of Israel's hope lift up his face upon you and give you shalom. Have a great day.
In Jesus' name, amen.